Welcome everybody to our assigning staff security roles in Microsoft 365, um, ways to grant authority and responsibility. I'm Gerald Holland, I'm the CTO at MyTech Partners, and uh, with me today I've got Stephanie Kingsley, who's going to be helping me produce this, uh, this production, um, and we'll just kind of get into it here. So, um, assigning staff and security roles. Today we're going to go over why to delegate the responsibility. What, what is the, why would we want to even talk about assigning security roles? Um, what kinds of roles exist and what, what do they actually give you? Um, and then demonstrate, you know, how to actually, you know, how to delegate some of this ownership and what does it actually provide to you as we move forward. <clears throat> we'll also have a, a short period of time at the end to do a QA. and a um, So if you do have questions uh, as we're going through this, please make sure you post them in the, uh, in the Q&A section of the chat. So before we get too, too deep into this, I just kind of want to give a little bit about my tech here. Um, because the sessions that we do like this, a lot of people think that we're a training company, but my tech is actually a, a business technology consultancy um, that we focus on small to medium sized organizations. Over the last 20 years, we've developed a proven IT strategy that helps us, uh, helps our clients uh, remove IT challenges from their, uh, from their business environments um, and, and get more productivity and value out of their IT investments. Um, when we put this all together, we really do work and strive to make IT easy for our clients, allowing them to focus on their businesses and their clients instead of their IT struggles. So uh, that's enough about what my tech actually is. Uh, just kind of want to get that out of the way to make sure that everybody understands that we're not a training company. Um, but uh, we'll kind of get into why to have security roles. So having security roles, the, the biggest premise around this is delegating this administration down to the people that are directly involved with their actions. If we can get rid of the, the need to have, um, you know, always escalating tickets up to, to the sysadmins or the, the major administrators of your system and actually get down to the people that are doing the day-to-day -day tasks, we can actually speed up the process of, of what it takes to assign people to groups, um, get it down into the, the actual organization and the people that are actually doing that work. But we can also work to make sure that we maintain the governance of the, of the data inside the organization, making sure that the people that need access to that data have access to it, but the people that don't um, are not, and that we're also not generating risk by, by having multiple groups or, or teams set up that aren't really necessary inside the organization. So what kind of security roles are there? Um, there's actually five layers of security that we have developed. Um, four of these exist by default. We've added a fifth one that we've designed uh, for our clients, um, and, and we recommend to a lot of people to make sure that they utilize also. So global admins, this is, this is also a, uh, considered a role admin. Um, global admins have basically ultimate power. They can do just about anything inside the system. Um, they're usually your, your IT people, uh, your IT personnel. Many times we are the global admins of our client systems. This basically gives us the ultimate authority to do everything. We can do it many times through back end channels. So we're using different administration panels, different functions. And we'll, we'll show you a little bit of that today just to kind of show you what's capable. But um, we can override any of those rights that are assigned to anybody else. Power users is an actually a unique area that we create um, for our clients, but power users is, is a, they're allowed to do some of the admin functions, but not everything. Um, so they're not quite to the level of a delegated admin, but they they do we do provide them rights to do certain actions that we don't want normal users to be able to do. Um, group and team owners, um, we, we kind of use group and team kind of interchangeably because a lot of people think of uh, Microsoft Teams teams um, as as you know as a as an organizational object that they want to be able to manage, but it's actually controlled by a group. So that's kind of why we, we use these, these terms back and forth, um, but they have the rights to manage that group itself. So if I assign ownership rights to a group, the owner of that group has the rights to modify and manage that group alone, nothing else inside the system. Um, users, that's most of the people, right? That's everybody else that's engaging in the platform and, and being part of the, the system. And then we also do have a guest level. These are external people that you're inviting into your organization to interact. Um, they do have a different level of security, but it is kind of a, um, they are kind of their own little, their, their subsection of users, but they do have some additional security controls on top of it. So what makes this all possible? Well, 
It's all focused around something called a Microsoft 365 group, or it used to be known as an O365 group uh, until Microsoft decided to change their naming structure recently. Um, it's also known as a unified group in the backend systems. Um, a unified group basically is only available in the cloud, so that means it's not going to take part of the same group structures that you might have on your local file server or your Active Directory. It's strictly up inside the 365 platform, but it also allows for these owner and guest permissions. So we can have people um, take ownership of this and manage uh, features, but it is also the component that allows teams and planner and all of these other actions to all be part of this structure and be um, kind of feed through what exactly we're trying to do. So let's go into the details of what some of these groups are or some of the, the, the levels that we assign to these groups. Um, so power users. Power users uh, do not exist by default. So that, like I mentioned before, we, we create these and we configure the system to say this group of users are allowed to do certain actions inside the environment. In the case of what we do for a lot of our clients is power users are actually defined to be allowed to create Microsoft 365 groups, um, which means that they can create new teams and everything else. We also train them on how to, how to you know, understand what the business risks are and what the, the business strategy is. Um, and, if, and if you're really interested in that, I recommend that you come and talk to us uh, or come to one of our, our power user sessions. This is really where we focus on the pros and cons of taking these actions, right? Um, What's going to happen when I create these groups? What what is the why would I want to do that? Um, there's a lot of lot of pros and cons that you really have to think about before doing it, and that's really the job of the power user. Um, but we allow them to create Microsoft 365 groups that gives them teams, plans, sites, whatever it might be that's tied to that Microsoft 365 group. I think this will be a good way of doing that um, to secure that that structure. What can owners do? Owners are are that first line of, of, of management. Um, they can assign the features and rights. So inside like Microsoft Teams, for example, they can actually assign what features are available to the users or the members of that team. Um, they, they, can, they can choose the, the actions. Uh, we'll, we'll show you in a demonstration here shortly um, what features are available to the rest of the, the group. Um, they're also able to um, add membership or to re, uh, accept approvals um, of membership re requests into the teams. So they can actually add and remove people as necessary. So this is this is really big. Um, you know, if you take like a finance department, you might need somebody who is a manager of the finance department to actually be able to say, I need somebody to access this data. They can grant that access and then revoke that access as necessary also. Um, and they can also, depending upon the configuration um, set up by the sysadmins, they can also be allowed to invite guest users. So if you're allowed to have guest users inside your environment, this is one of the ways to be able to add those users into the structure. Um, users and guests. So what do users and guests give us? Users and guests give us basically, they're, they're going to be the, your, your typical interface. They, um, if you put all the security structures in place, they are not allowed to create teams, but they can join public groups. They can request to join private groups, um, which would then be approved by an owner. Um, and they're, they're limited in security by the way that the owner or the um, power user set in place for the, for the team um, or structure that's set up for that. And guests are invited by team owners. They act very much like a user inside of a team. Um, but they also have additional security controls that can be applied to them to say, hey, we don't want you to be able to do certain actions. Um, and we'll show you how that all interfaces here with Teams. So I do have a demonstration that we will uh, we'll kind of get into and we'll show you how this all works. So let me uh, let me change over my screen here. Get this all off of here, and then we'll pull up our Microsoft Teams here. Let me make sure I get into the right user. So I pulled up a web browser here with Microsoft Teams, um, and we're going to start at the top here. We'll just kind of go through what it looks like to be an administrator. So I am a global admin of this of this uh, Microsoft tenant. 
So I have access to see everything um, inside of the platform. I'm signed in as myself. Um, and inside of here, I'm inside the Teams Admin Center. You'll see that I can see all the teams that we have inside of our environment. Um, even a lot of these, I am not a administrator of, or I'm not an owner of these teams, but I can still see them and I can still pull up data about these. So uh, if I take up, um, if I take up the operations team, for example, I am not an owner of the operations team. Uh, in here, you'll see that there are uh, two owners. So JF and Nathan Austin are owners of this, but everybody else is a member. I am a member of this team, but I could actually remove myself as even a member of the team, and I would still see the same features. I can still go inside of here. I can see the channels. I can see the settings. I can even make changes to this as necessary. So if I wanted to make sure that um, a, a new user that I have called standard um, user is actually a member of this team, I can do this and I can make these changes without actually having to go into the team's interface or be anything, be part of that, that structure. The advantage of this is I can make the changes without having to be owners, without having to be anything else. Um, I can also go in here and I can also force certain settings. Now, if I force these settings, these settings are actually gonna override what the owner can do. So even the owner can't override um, or cannot change these settings if I force them a certain way. So we can actually change the way that the structure works from an administration standpoint, but for the most part, the owners are going to have a lot of rights inside of this. So give you an example of what this looks like. You note that I am a member of the operations team. Inside of Microsoft Teams, you can see I am a member of operations, so I can see data inside of here. But if I actually go here to manage the team as myself, you can see I can't actually do much inside of here at all. I can see some analytics data, I can see the channel information, but I can't, you know, if I go to add a member, I can see a request to add. I'm not actually adding a member, I am going to be sending a request to JF and Nathan Austin to actually have them uh, approve that person coming into the system. So this is, this is kind of a, a different view of this, um, but you can show that even though I can add somebody to this team, I can't actually, from an administration standpoint, I can't do it actually inside the interface at all. Um, if I go to a team that I am an owner of though, uh, so I am an owner of, of uh, the I, internal IT system, and I go here to manage team, you'll see here that I get a lot of other features. So I am listed as an owner here. Um, but now I also get the pending request features. So if somebody was asking to come into this team, they would show up as a pending request. Um, I can also see channels, uh, settings is a new menu that I get here. Um, and this is where I can actually start making changes as an owner. Um, so since I am an owner of this, this is where I can make permission changes to members. This is where I can turn off features. Maybe I don't wanna give them the ability to delete their messages. Maybe this is a key piece and I don't want them to, you know, maybe I've got some kind of compliancy control or I've got uh, a business need that I don't ever want people to delete or modify their messages that they might have. Um, we can turn those functions off and that will take effect for anybody inside the team. We can also go in and we can talk about who can uh, create channels, create private channels. If we don't want people creating channels, maybe I want this as a fixed structure and I only want the people that have the power to do things. I can say, I would don't want people to be able to create or modify channels. That's just the way it is. Um, they can create tabs inside the channels, they can do all of that, but now my members can't do anything in here other than, um, other than interact with the structure I have built. We can also go inside of this stuff and we can say, um, maybe we want to remove the, the Giphy, the stickers, um, maybe this is a HR channel, right? And I don't want actually people being able to to use the fun meme type stuff, we can turn all of this off um, and it'll keep it nice and clean. So we can do all these functions all inside of here um, as, as an owner uh, and above. So anybody who is an owner and above will have this, this level of access into what they're doing. Um, power users. So one of the things that is unique about a power user is the ability to join or create a team. So a power user can actually create a team um, so if I go to um, Teams, 
inside of here. Oh man, technical glitch. I don't know where it went. Ah. I just screwed myself up on the demo. Um, so normally I would have the ability here to actually create a team, um, but I have removed the ability for me to do that. So let me actually go in here quick and give myself this right back. So in our structure, we actually create this O365 group creators. And this has the ability to actually lock out who can create groups. So right now I'm just going to set up set up myself as a as a member of this group. Um, I'm going to also add Stephanie and Nathan Austin here. So by doing that now. Um, I have now added people to this group that are allowed to actually create teams. If I go back into Microsoft Teams here, I'm going to just refresh this page. This will basically sign me back into Teams. And now you can see that I've added this create a team uh, function. So just by myself to the power user group, I have now created the ability for me to create a team. Um, inside of here, this is where I can actually build a team. I can create new 365 groups or use existing ones to be able to do functions. Um, but if I'm not part of this, I'm not able to actually see that create a team. So this is the power that we provide to power users is power users have the ability to create those teams. They're the ones that understand the, the risks, the benefits of creating that team. And you don't get people just creating uh, teams you know, as they want which is the default inside Microsoft. So it's kind of a risk. Um, I know organizations that have had a lot of problems with that as we've, um, as we've seen in the past where teams just get created, you don't realize it, and then before you know it, you've got six or seven finance teams out there, um, and each one of them is owned by a different person and controlled by a different person, um, and, and it can be a real problem inside your organization. You get something what we call data sprawl, um, and you can easily get orphaned data, so data that is inside that team that just all of a sudden disappears um, because of the way that it's being stored. So I've also got another browser here, though. Let me open up this browser. So this browser is my standard user um, user account, and inside of this one, you can see that I've got a restricted set. Inside of here, I'm not an owner of any of these teams, so I can I can go in here and I can say manage team, and you'll see that I have the same restrictions that I had as not being an admin or an owner of a team and the same functions if I go into uh, I can go into join a team but I can't create any teams um, you can see that I'm also like I have not joined this public continuity team uh, or this business continuity team which is a public team and I can actually request to join this and by doing that it will actually automatically join me because it is a public team um, I am allowed just to join that as a standard member user So going with that, that kind of shows you the, uh, the simple steps as to what kind of permissions we can do and how we set the structures up for um, what people can, uh, what, what access people have into the platform um, and how we can control the various levels of, of protection around this. So if there are any questions, Stephanie, do we, uh, do we have any yet? Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet, so if anybody does have questions or there's something you would like Gerald to demonstrate, feel free to post them in the Q&A. Now, Gerald, the, the power user um, portal that you showed, is that something that MyTech created and we can deploy for our clients, or can you kind of talk about how that's different than um, Microsoft 365's kind of security groups? Yep, so Microsoft security groups are 
are far more um, open, um, and, and we find that in larger enterprises that works okay um, because they have the ability to uh, to put in the, the data governance rules into the system to be able to manage um, having all those teams and having the ability for users to create their own teams. But in small organizations, you just don't have the controls that are necessary to do some of that kind of stuff. And many times even the features and rights that are necessary inside um, the 365 platform. So we created a, um, a set of groups and controls that we put in place. There's a bunch of uh, PowerShell code in the background that has to be run to activate these features. Um, but when we do run these groups, we set it up so that the, the users that have access to um, to the power users group to be able to create teams and to create all of that kind of stuff are added in, you know, as we add users to that group, they gain access to be able to do those functions and create teams as necessary. So that is that is something that's unique to what MyTech does, um, but it is, you know, it, it's, it's available to a lot of people. It's just the, the feature set to be able to activate it um, does require some skill. Awesome. Also, um, I know one of the questions we get asked a lot in other sessions is uh, regarding guests into the Microsoft 365 environment. Can you talk a little bit about just best practices for that? And I don't know if there's any, you know, for our clients, we're the ones that can enable that in the back end, but maybe just some best practices or tips for um, those out there who are going back and forth on whether, how, or why they should allow guests into the organization. Yeah, so allowing guests is um, is definitely a, a pro con scenario. Um, it, it can it can really aid in uh, communication with another organization or with clients as as necessary, but it also runs the risk of data exfiltration. So people being able to take your data that you might share in there. Um, so obviously some risks that you have to kind of evaluate from a, there is some actions that need to be completed on the sysadmin side with saying, yes, we want to allow um, guests to be enabled into the platform. Um, once that is done, and you can you can do that actually in a lot of different ways. So you can say it globally, or you can actually specify um, individual uh, company domain names that you want to allow to. Um, but once you do activate those actions, um, it is it is you know you can set it up on a per team basis as to whether whether or not you want to let um, uh, guest users join into a team. Um, and whether or not you want to allow um, the owners of those teams to be able to invite them in also. So it, a lot of times it's all about setting up, you know, what are the business rules around it to making sure that people don't just um, start inviting guests, but actually building the structure. Um, I believe by default, Microsoft is still shipping with guests as disabled. Um, so you have to go in and turn it on in order to even bring somebody in. We do have somebody asking if you could, if that's something that you could possibly demonstrate where that would be and maybe some of the options that are available or like you were saying, some of the restrictions that you can put in place. So around uh, around guest access? Yes. Okay, so around, there are restrictions that you can put in place in um, inside Teams. So if I go into a team that I am an owner of here, um, manage team. So inside of here, if I go to settings, Actions, once you have a guest that is enabled, so you can actually go here and you can actually, um, if I actually turn uh, channel rights back on for members, um, you can see that I can actually turn off the ability. By default, guests are not allowed to create channels, so they're actually restricted as to some of the actions that they can perform. Uh, Microsoft does have some roadmap stuff to expand these operations, but uh, or to give you more restrictions for guest users, but. Currently, these are these are the two, so we can control that they cannot update or create channels um, or, or delete them either. So we can do those kinds of actions. Uh, we can also give them those those rights. Um, and then underneath for managing, I'm going to try to keep this pretty high level here. Um, but if we go to, uh, I believe it's underneath. External uh, guest access. Here we go. So if we go to our org wide settings, this is where we can actually allow guest access. So here we've actually turned on guest access. We can also say what kind of controls we want allowed. Do we want to allow guests to be able to come into meetings and are they allowed to share media, uh, share video? Are they allowed to share their screens? Um, we can set a lot of those messaging type options. 
at a global level. Um, and if I remember, apologize if you see me poking around a little bit on this one, but if I go to settings and uh, it might be a policy. So inside of the policy here, um, to be honest, I don't remember exactly where it has, is, but that's um, there is a policy that you can say whether or not a team is allowed to um, create the guest access controls. Um, the other sides of guest access with um, restricting to domains is actually done underneath the SharePoint portal. Um, where you actually say what domains are allowed to have access externally, um, and then that also affects the guest access side of things too. Awesome. But ultimately, I mean, my tech, kind of our stance on it is that this is something that should be probably controlled by your sysadmin, um, yep. just because they're going to understand kind of the business rules, any compliance issues that you may have where a user is not going to fully understand the risks that they could be putting the organization or risk to compliances or regulations for opening up that guest, guest access. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. No, it is. It is definitely, um, you know, we make the recommendation to make sure that, uh, you know, like we'll challenge our clients enough just to say, you know, we don't just do it. We're going to make sure that it makes sense to do um, before we actually activate it. Um, and, th and that's really the premise of why you would want to make sure that somebody is aware that these kinds of uh, rules are being turned on um, and that we allow those, uh, accept that responsibility if we're going to allow those kinds of actions to happen. Awesome. Other than that, I don't see any further questions in the Q&A panel um, today. Okay. So, so uh, we just want to say thank you to everybody for coming. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out afterwards. Otherwise, we will be sending a follow-up email with a link to this recording, um, along with a survey that we encourage everybody to fill out. Um, to just provide more context on to future sessions that you'd like to see. So thank you very much for coming.